Hey, welcome to Gold Scratch. So the job for today is going to be getting Will Casey's 350 1981 Corvette engine going. I just got his pistons on the weekend. So uh, we did that because we wanted to improve our quench height. And these pistons are two fly, uh, valve reliefs instead of four. They're also going to increase our compression a little bit. That is a, pro that is a subject of future videos. So today, if you watch my previous video, by the way, I'm ready to start my bench is clean and that's how we start every job with nothing on the bench okay so as soon as this video is done i'm lucky to have alec with me here today to help me out uh, and we're going to get the gearing 102 out of the way so we made a previous video a few days ago last week anyway uh, gearing 101 and I introduced a bunch of subjects and a bunch of information i got to correct a couple things and finish it off and probably this is the last video we're going to do about gearing. So to start with, uh, I got to correct something. So I used this illustration in the previous video, and I described a uh, spur gear, a helical gear. If you have a four-speed transmission in your car, you have helical gears in it, okay, four of them. And uh, actually three sets because the final drive is not a gear. It's just one-to-one. -one. So... Um, you have helical gears in it and then i had an illustration of differential gears so a miter gear and a high point gear but i drew the illustration wrong and i'm amazed that i got a lot of smart guys watching my videos and i'm amazed somebody didn't see it and make and tell me about it maybe it just didn't want to hurt my feelings i don't know because it was a pretty stupid mistake so anyway uh, a miter gear is when the input shaft is at 90 degrees to the output shaft. So your drive shaft is parallel to your car, your axle is at 90 degrees to it. So you got to change directions. The power is coming parallel. And so you use what's called a miter, miter or bevel gear. And this is a standard miter or bevel gear illustration. I think this is a little uh, clearer to what I was trying to show. And that's the center line of the gear and the pinion. They're on the same center line. A gear in, a, in your car, almost all cars, unless they're really old, is called a hypoid gear. And I'm just going to just stay the ca camera there, Alec, I'll jump over. So here's the pinion out of my 488 Camaro. I've showed this some other pinions before. It's obviously a very, very complicated gear. So a hypoid gear, there's where your pinion goes. And the ring gear is in the other direction. The difference between it and a miter gear is the center line of the input shaft is a different center line than the center line of the output shaft. So uh, that gets your drive shaft lower in the car. Why do they do that? They do that to get your car down on the ground because if it had to be on the same center line, your car would have to be that much higher off the ground because you need room for your transmission. You have to have uh, an angle in your drive shaft, usually about four degrees, and that makes sure those little needle bearings in your universal joint keep turning. So you need four degrees of an angle. And there's other reasons for that, by the way, as well. So that's the high point gear. So all, pretty much all, and that's the subject of today is high point gears. So uh, I wanted to correct that. And thanks very much for those who probably noticed it and were nice enough not to tell me. So I appreciate that. So uh, what I'm gonna do today is finish off the installation of the uh, differential for you and then come back and cover off a few other points that I think are, are worth noting and answer a few questions that I've had on my channel. Before I forget, please like and subscribe. Uh, we're doing good, our channel's growing. We're pretty happy with it and uh, we think it can get a lot bigger. We're working hard to make uh, good videos for you. We do two things at Gold Scratch. We make videos, but we gotta get work done too. So. Uh, we're trying to mix, put that together, and when I'm lucky enough to have somebody like Alex available to help me do it, uh, that really helps a lot. So, over to our differential. So, since when we left the first video, uh, what I was doing is basically describing how we were doing it. And I finished the job off, and nobody was around with the camera. It took a lot longer than it should have. And so I'm going to describe to you what I did. There are lots of good detailed videos on YouTube about all the exact details you need to do to install a rear end. I'm going to cover off the points for you. 
but I can't, I'm not able to do that in this case. So one of the things that I mentioned in the previous video was that back in the day, and I hate to keep using that term, but that's what it was. When these cars were new, typically we used the old bearings and we used the old carrier and we changed gear ratios. So we got the, in, the, the bearing on your uh, input shaft. It goes on this shaft right here. Okay, is the most critical one. There's a shim between that bearing and the shaft. And you need to know what that shim is because most of the time we were able to get away with using the original shims, both on the input shaft and on the carrier and change gears. We often even use the cast iron gears and the, the gear caps, the bearing caps hold it all in. They work just fine, did it lots of times. These are all drag racing cars, by the way. So uh, that worked well. However, I don't want to leave anybody with many misunderstandings. Uh, that didn't work for me in this case. And so as far as the pinion goes, it did work. But as far as the, the side clearance on the gear, it didn't. And the reason it didn't is Mike bought a different carrier. He was also converting from an open gear to a pause attraction. So he bought a brand new carrier from Auburn Gear. And that carrier is a little bit different in width than the original carrier. So the original shims did not work. And I found that out from bitter experience because I had it in a few times before I figured that out. And I finally got it right. So where I was at at the last video, I was actually honing out this little bearing. And one of the things you need to do is the, the bearing that, go, that comes on your pinion shaft originally is pressed on with a very hard press, tooth towel press, and you don't want to be taking them on and off. So I used the old bearing and honed it out with a simple brake cylinder hone. Got a couple, got some, a little bit of clearance enough to be able to slide it on and off. So we could assemble the pinion shaft without the crush sleeve. So here's the crush sleeve. This goes in when you finally finish it. Assemble it without the crush sleeve, without the seal, I get the right rotational torque, put the carrier in, get the right pinion depth, right? And we were able to use the original 32,000 shim new bearings, put it back together, torqued it back together. The input shaft is in and good to go. That wasn't a problem. When you finally do torque it in to get that about 20 inch pounds of rotational torque, you actually got to squash this little uh, compressible sleeve that goes over your pinion, and that's how you get preload on your Timken bearings. Timken bearings have to be preloaded. This may take 200 foot pounds of torque to do that, so it's no simple task. And that's why once you get it in, you wanna make sure it's in there for good. You're not taking it out again. So it is, then the carrier goes in, and then you shim side to side, and you get preload. And that's when I found out I couldn't use the original shims, but we got it. And it's done. Mike has the, the, the cover at home, cleaning it up and painting it. And when he gets back, we'll put it back together. Uh, but once again, I, I was not able to use uh, the original shims as I intended. And if you change carriers, you probably won't either. If you don't change carriers, there's a pretty good chance the original shims uh, are going to work for you. So we've got a gear pattern. Whatever way you do, do it, you got to verify it. So maybe we'll get in, Alex, and take a quick look. You paint it with this yellow paint that's made for that purpose. This is actually the coast side. It's hard to see the drive side from here. But you paint it and make sure you got a pattern. And there's, I'm not going to get into that detail today. There's lots of examples of patterns on the internet and on YouTube about what the right pattern is. Basically, you want to get in the middle of the tooth as much as you can, not too deep in the tooth and not too much to the edge of the tooth. And so that's done and it's ready to go. So hopefully I covered that off. Any more questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, before I forget, we do have a tip of the day coming. Um, somebody that watches my videos named David Callahan said, no pressure, but I would like to see a picture of your car when it was back in the day or new. So, so in 1969, I didn't even have a camera. We never took pictures of anything. We didn't have cell phones back then, right guys? So if you wanted to take a picture, you had to have an Instamatic camera, take the film to a developer, 
buy the film, get the developer. It was expensive, time consuming, and not like it is today. So fortunately, my late brother-in-law did take one picture of it for me and he gave it to me. So this is my 68 Camaro on the drag strip. If you look closely, it's an Ontario 1969 license plate. And back in the day, what they did was, if you look closely, you can see the drag strip sign or whatever it was. So obviously I was in the left lane. So what they did then, we used white shoe polish to put the number of the car on the windshield and the class. So this was called E-Stock. So David, you asked for a picture of my car back in the day. There it is. So that's the best I have. I cherish that picture because it is the only one uh, that I have. So let me cover off a couple more things that I didn't uh, cover properly last time. I had M21 versus M22 transmission. This is the so-called rock crusher and i describe why they call it that in the video i didn't even have m20 on there so it's a really important thing to understand m20 transmission uh, same architecture as an m21 transmission only uh, wide ratio so it had a 2.52 to one first gear m21 had 2.2 to one first gear so close ratio transmissions in z28s at least were designed for road racing. So they wanted them close because they didn't care about coming off the line. They just wanted to have the minimum RPM drop between shifts. And that's why they use close ratios. So if you ordered a car uh, from GM, and I think it's true whether it's a Chev or a Pontiac or an Oldsmobile, if it had a 355 or lower numerical number, then you got an M20 transmission. If it had a 373 or higher numerical number, you automatically got an M21 transmission. And in 1970, they come out with the M22, the so-called rock crushers. I described that in the past. Uh, they have less helix angle to reduce the thrust, and they're actually thicker gear, thicker teeth on the gear. They're less teeth per inch of pitch diameter, and so that makes them stronger as well. So I covered that off. I think I covered 10 bolt versus 12 bolt. I mentioned four nine inch and uh, somebody commented, a subscriber commented, what about the Mopar rear end? They made a Dana rear end, which is also probably as strong. Uh, they were used actually in dragsters back in the day very commonly and a lot of other drag racing type cars. And lots of details about picking a gear ratio uh, as well. So I think that covers off Changing the rear end, once again, there's lots of detailed videos about how to do that, but I'll try to bring out some simple points that'll save you some time. Um, and so I'm gonna to get to the tip of the day. I think I've covered everything else off. Oh, before I forget, yes. Go to my cheap cheat notes here. Uh, I've had Bill Little on some of my videos in the past. Every time I have Bill on the video, the comments are, give me more stuff with Bill. So we're gonna do that. Uh, Bill is the local uh, guru that builds probably the best drag racing engines anywhere in this area anyways. And we've been to his shop. He has a flow bench. He has a cam doctor. And so this Saturday, Bill is going to dyno an engine that belongs to Tim Blyde from St. Thomas. He's a drag racer. It's a 565 cubic inch big block Chevrolet engine. It's going to make more than 800 horsepower on the dyno. So if you like watching my four or 500 horsepower engines on the dyno, you're going to love this. Uh, I'm going to go, Alex is going to come with me and help me video it. I'm going to interview Bill. He's going to describe the engine for you. Interview Tim, give you all the details, watch it on the dyno and watch the master at work trying to squeeze out the last horsepower from that 565 cubic inch engine. It's going to be pretty exciting. So. Everybody likes dyno videos, and this is going to be one that's probably the most exciting one I've ever done. But I'm not really in charge of this one. I'm just going to be doing uh, narrating it, basically. So, so tip of the day. Uh, talked about uh, one of my previous videos. I talked about the guys that design these engines use slide rules. And now you have calculators, right, or computers, okay? So what the heck is the slide rule? So this uh, Roland Cron actually was nice enough. He saw the video and he brought me 
a slide rule. And I looked around, I thought I had my old slide rule from back in the day, but I could not find it. So this is a slide rule. So when I was going to college, there were no calculators, there were no computers. Everything was done by slide rule. And I actually forgot how to use it. I, I was able to play it around, get, adding, subtracting, multiplying, or sorry, doesn't add, subtract, multiplies and divides. I, got, I was able to do that and um, get it working. And it wasn't until into the, well into the 70s before calculators came along. So if you're not old enough to remember that, the first calculator costs a lot of money, I think around $100. And all it could do was add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Use 4A batteries that lasted about two hours and they were done. So big difference, but can you imagine guys designing these engines this way? And even in education, the amount of time that we spent on our slide rules getting to the answer where you get to it almost automatically now with computers. So that is a slide roll. So thought I would show you that. I did forget one thing while I was doing gearing, I mentioned that we never ever changed carriers. And so this prompted me to remember that. So if you buy GM and there's differences in all the differentials, but I happen to get no GMs. So there's a three series carrier and a four series carrier. So if you have any gear ratio in the three numbers, uh, you have one carrier. And so what happens is as the gear ratio gets higher numerically, this is a 488, the pinion gets smaller, it gets farther away from the gear. So how do you fix that? The right way to fix that, you buy a four series carrier. In 1970 or 69, are you kidding? We never bought anything like that. We would use the same carrier and use, this is Mr. Gasket spacer. They come out of my 488 rear end when I took it apart in 2015 or 16. I put in in 1969, it worked just fine, never failed. That's how you made up for differences in carriers. So cover that off. I think that's it for today. Uh, as soon as this video is over, Alec and I are going to get together and get going on this on Will's engine. Thank you for watching my videos. Please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.